The Oakland Athletics have decided to make their first trade of the year as we send Ramon Laureano, center fielder who was suspended to start the year, playing mostly in double A and triple A. He will head over to the Phillies in exchange for two, I won't say prospects, Jose Alvarado and Micah Bell. Uh, Micah Bell, obviously one of their better prospect pitchers, wasn't doing much for them. He was sitting in Class A ball as Jose Alvarado was killing it for them this year. But they wanted a center fielder more than they wanted pitching, so we decided to take on Jose Alvarado. And they get their new starting center fielder in Lam- or Ramon Laureano. I got to show you here that um, he is the starting center fielder. He's already on the MLB roster, so he's doing much better on their team than in ours. Meanwhile, Micah Bell will jump right to the double A team and have his first start almost instantly. The 6'5, 195 pitcher was sitting in class A ball for the Phillies and was not doing much. I looked at other guys to see which one would make more sense, but at the time, Micah Bell wasn't doing anything. They were willing to give him to us for very little. As you can see, I just kind of let the whole first inning play out here. I check out the lineup of the Tulsa team, and their best hitter is Cody Hoes. Cody there, the third baseman. But we're going to go through Micah Bell's first start just to kind of look at another prospect and pitcher. Obviously, we're looking to trade our two top pitchers in Sean Manaya and Frankie Montez. So having more pitchers or I guess more prospect at the starting pitcher spot would be nice. Of course, we did draft a few in the past draft. Uh, but Micah Bell, he, pitching this game, I didn't really look at his stats too much when I traded for him. But he had really good control, like, playing this game. That curveball there got away from him, but it got him his first strikeout there. But you'll see a lot of the time pitching here, I didn't really miss many spots, and I guess by me, I mean he didn't because I don't really have much control. I'm just hitting a button. But he missed some early on, but once he got in a, like a groove, he did not miss many. Here's Cody, the top hitter for the Drillers here. Um, I'm not sure with my minor league teams who or like what minor league team is for one major league team. I know where the... I don't even know, Midla- Midland team or whatever we are. The Rockers, I think it is, or Rockhounds. Uh, here battling back from a 3-0 count, McAbell makes it 3-2. Two outs, he's on his 12th pitch of the at-bat. And he calls for the fastball high. And it's a fly ball to center field to get out of the first inning. So his first inning of work, oh, I guess, it, oh yeah, so... uh. A missed dive, Cody goes to second and gets thrown out. I forgot that happened there. But uh, we jump around. Mostly just going to be watching the pitching here. If anything interesting happens, I'll probably show the offensive stuff. Um, here, gets a strikeout and then an 0-2, two outs. He gets another strikeout here at a very high fastball. Jumping around to the third here. I don't see know who it was but he gets strike out you see Micah Bell had a lot of strikeouts in this game but he also had a lot of base runners on uh there's another base runner on here but gets the next batter to pop up to Robert Poussin and Micah Bell's probably right now our top pitching prospect now obviously I think potential wise he's our only A here's McCann I don't know his first name but it's a McCann catcher who somehow guns down this runner uh, I guess it was a bad jump, but it looked like he was already there, but got a perfect throw. He's our, I guess, one of our last ones. He's a great play by Robert Poussin over to Max Muncy for one, over to Lawrence Butler for the second. A great play there from our young middle infield. Now here, Micah Bell gets another strikeout. I'm not sure how many he had this game. I showed at the end. I want to say it's roughly around eight strikeouts, but just a great pitch mix i guess he has he has two fastballs a circle change a curveball and i think a slider here's one of the pitches he left right over the middle and i don't know who it was but they did not miss but we're still up two to one and he bounced back by striking out the best hitter on the team which is always a good sign 
Here, McCann again guns down a runner who seems to have left real early. I don't know who McCann is, and I don't think his fielding ratings are that good. But he's doing great. Here, we get subbed out for the rest of the game, so I kind of just simulate through. Uh, you see not much happens after that. We do pretty well pitching. Weisenberg comes out, gets a save. He it's 2-1 to one in a Bell's debut, and yeah, six innings, six hits allowed, eight strikeouts, two walks, only one earned run. He was the player of the game, and he had a really good game, but did still allow a good amount of hits and walks. Jump back to the Major League team. As you see, we get a win here against the Mariners, 11-4. to I showed the stats here. Um, I'm not sure if any changes happened yet. It doesn't look like it. But I quickly go through the stats. Montez had a pretty decent outing. Pruitt actually had a blown save. Guerra had, well, I guess the win. Colorac gets a one inning performance, I guess. Um, here are the notices we get uh, for the month of May as that finished up. Or, sorry, June. Um, Bale Carlick was killing it. That's probably our main guy I was looking at here. Um, him and Lawrence Butler were the two I was looking at. Lawrence Butler in Triple A, Carlick in Double A. Bicka Bell obviously only had two games, but worked really well. And here I decided to make a change. Nick Allen was a bench bat for us who was not hitting well, so I decided to call him down to Triple A, move Bale Carlick up to Triple A as well, and then call up to the MLB Lawrence Butler who was killing it in both the Double A and the Triple A. Uh, at least with his bat. Uh, another guy here, Steven Boat. I decided to release him. He wasn't doing well for us, and he kept dropping overall, so I decided to get rid of him. We now have two first basemen on the team, and we have a backup catcher already. And that makes room for Zach Jaloff. Um, he was killing it in double A. He did pretty well in triple A in the short time he was there, so I called him up, and almost instantly, I have him starting against lefties. He had a two home run looking for his third home run against the Rangers. He was in a three for three day with two homers and a single. And here he's batting against Kobe Allard. Eight or the yeah, the A's are up seven to four right now. So not exactly a dominating performance from the A's, but still seven runs is pretty well. As here he misses a cutter in the zone. Jalov's the prospect I was very excited for at third base, and he's been doing really well. And obviously, since being called up, he's only starting against lefties as of now. Uh, there is a chance if Noisy doesn't pick up the slack he has recently, that Jaloff starts every day, or even he moves to DH if whoever our DH is isn't doing well. Uh, but here, one two count, Jaloff looking for that homer. He strikes out on the check swing. I don't know if this was Jaloff's first game or if it was his second. Um, but he had a really good first game if it was. Um, I think that's all the hitting opportunities he had. Um, he comes in a few times to do fielding, because his fielding's only like a 50 or a 40. So I wanted to show it while he got the opportunities here. Uh, here's Nick Solak, who's actually going to bunt in a 3-2 count, which makes zero sense, but hey. We get the fielding opportunity here. Throws over to Lawrence... Butler, who I think I called Lawrence Diaz once or twice before, but he, Lawrence Butler is a good fielder, so we'll have him play first more often. He can also play the outfield. Uh, here we go over to the eighth. Pruitt is up against Mitch Garber, and the power hitting catcher decides to drop a bunt because this game makes sense. And I'm pretty sure we had a shift going that way anyway, so welcome to MLB The Show. Another defensive play there by uh, Jaloff. You see the Rangers couldn't get much going. Jaloff almost had a second at bat. But Trevino gets a save here. Actually two on, two out. Jaloff gets another fielding opportunity. I'm not sure why. I'm expecting bunt because that's what they did the last two times. So I move up with Jaloff. But it's just a hard hit ball too short. Who cannot make the play. So maybe I should have made it. But now the bases are loaded. Uh, winning runs at the plate for the Rangers. But a fielder's choice gets them out of the game. And the A's win 7-4 against the Rangers. Jaloff wins player of the game. Cole Irvin 
Eight hits allowed, no strikeouts, only one run, though, while John Gray allowed seven in four and two-thirds innings. Here we start simulating through more Rangers games, and I guess AAA and AA minor league games, but we don't see them. You see most of the stats as we're coming up to the All-Star break. We're 29-65. Paul Blackburn's on the mound, who we actually jump into a game with him. He is actually a reliever that I've thrown into the starting lineup. He has pretty good stamina for a reliever. I think it's in the 60s or 70s. And he was doing really well while we had Brett Honeywell and Jorge Juan, two starting pitchers that weren't doing well. So at the time, I moved Blackburn to the starting spot, and he's honestly not been that bad. I'm not expecting him to be like a sub-3 ERA starting pitcher. I'm not even expecting him to be a sub-4 ERA, really. I'm just expecting him to work at least five decent innings. Here's a great double play by Lawrence Butler, just diving, making the catch, tagging the base there. But Blackburn, I just want him trying to work four, maybe even five innings. We'll get a long reliever in if we need to. But he's been doing really well. Uh, Jalof there with great fielding. Here he's worked three innings strong, only allowed two hits. But now he's stuck with the bases loaded and a sack fly here. Seth Brown under it. He doesn't get a running start. I get a bad camera angle here. And that's the Rangers' first run of the game. As now there's two outs in the fourth. I just try to get out of it with Blackburn. Here is Cole Calhoun. Takes in a cutter inside strike one. Another pitch repertoire that I like a lot is Blackburn's. Obviously, I talked about Micah Bell's earlier. But I like Blackburn's as well. No problem is he's not the best pitcher. So here, Cole Calhoun, deep to center field, and Christian Pache can't hold on to it or can't really get to it. One run scores, or actually two. Yeah, no, one run scores. The other one comes across. Cole Calhoun gets a two-run double or a two RBI double, I guess. No, two-run double. I was right. And then Eli White hits a ground ball, first pitch over to Andrews. So he works four. He did struggle towards the end there. And instantly, Christian Pache makes it up by making a home run back. They decide to keep Blackburn in the game. And with a runner on and one out, he allows a base knock down the line to Solak, who gets a double, advances the run to the third. And that's when they decide to take him out as they call upon someone else, and it's Brent Honeywell, who almost instantly allows these runs to come in with an RB two-run double by Seeger and then a two-run home run from the next batter. So now it's a 7-1 to one game. Here is Seth Brown and Jaloff. Back-to-back Wolves, Butler can't score him. Murphy hits a double there. And not much happens. I'm pretty sure we get demolished in this game. We only score one run, maybe a few. Uh, 10 to 1 now. We just got out of the last inning. Here's Jaloff and Brown, that 3 4, or I guess that 4 5. Doing pretty well in this game, but doesn't mean much. Here's Sean Murphy doing well. Dalton Kelly got a single, and then Andrews got a single. Another single from Pinder makes it a 10 to 5 game, so I'll, I guess I was wrong. 10 to 6 now. Batting around Christian Pache, but he can't get on base to continue the rally. A four-run nine will lead to nothing as the Rangers still win 10-6. to Not the best pitching day for any of our pitchers, but Blackburn allowed five earned runs in four and two-thirds innings. As we come to the final series before the All-Star break, we face the A's, the Future Stars game. I guess that's what it is. Uh, we have a game where Oakland is, we're trying to close out Oakland. Here I showed this for a little longer just so you guys see the team rankings. We're pretty much last in everything. But 3-2 count to Kyle Tucker Trevino, who's been having a great year for us. He comes in and he strikes out one of the better Astro players in Kyle Tucker. Now Luis Gurriel, he looks at a sinker down low. There is a runner at second. Who's about to get left stranded. Brantley's the last chance. 0-2, oh, two, 2 down. He pokes at a very far away pitch. Torino makes the play and he gets another save. Torino, when he has the opportunities, he's been doing amazing with them. Getting many saves. That's a low ERA. That was actually his 20th. He did blow, I think, 5 saves this year. 
I think it was. Which is really a, kind of a lot. But, I mean, we don't really get many balloon or save opportunities in general. So I like the fact that he has 20 of them. And we don't have many wins. So that he's doing some. He's on a chance to, or he has a chance to get re-signed in the offseason. Here we get an offer from the Twins, which I did not. I guess wanted to decline. I was very intrigued by this. Um, they're trying to give me prospect Nick Gordon at shortstop for Elvis Andrews. Here I look at the other player's stats, trying to see why they would need Elvis Andrews. Um, I just I don't think it would make sense to give up a prospect for a player that's just going to be a bench bat, especially Elvis Andrews, who's been having a really good year. Um, I look at his stats. He, he's having a much better year than their second baseman. Um, third base, they do have Austin Martin as well, a prospect that's been killing it. As well as Miranda, who's been doing pretty well. So if they needed a third baseman, they could probably just call one up. So they wouldn't need Andrews at third. And I'm like, all right, maybe short. Well, they have Jorge Polanco and... Um, I think Carlos Correa. So trading a prospect like Nick Gordon for Elvis Andrews, who will probably be at best a bench bat. I was trying to make sense to it, and I couldn't see it. So I ultimately declined the trade, even though I would love Nick Gordon on our team. I just saw no reason for them to want Elvis Andrews. Here, I don't play the All-Star game. I can in the future, but I look to see all the All-Stars, mainly ours, and Lou Trevino is one of them. Having, like I said, a great year, a 2-4-3 ERA, 20 of 25 on saves, and I mean, I think he had a 1.1 whip. Scrolling through the actual hitters for our side now, see a lot of guys that I'm not surprised with here, and then I see Elvis Andrews actually got an all-star selection for us he's batting 281 with a 335 obp he's been really well for us in the leadoff spot he has a 726 ops and he had a 0.6 war i was just surprised to see him actually make it especially with trevino being an all-star i know i'm pretty sure in this game they still do every team gets one so i thought ours would just be trevino but they, for some reason, they gave it to him as well. So we've simmed by the all-star break. And here we have a chance to hit a third home run in the game with Brown. Does not get it. Then the White Sox offer us another offer that I would love. Dylan Cease, a great young pitcher for Frankie Montez. So I look at the stats. Dylan Cease, a guy that I really want. He's having a good year as well. He's actually having a better year than Frankie Montez. Why they wanted him, I don't know. But looking at it, four or the four other pitchers in the MLB for them, which I think it's Lance Lynn, Giolito, Kopech, and Keuchel, they're all having amazing years. I think Kopech's having the worst with a 3-4-7 ERA. And then Keuchel is having a sub-3. Cease is actually their fourth worst pitcher. But if they trade him for Montez, he w Montez would become their worst pitcher, which just didn't make sense for a team that's trying to make the playoffs. So I declined it. You can see some of the trades here. Scar Scott Barlow got traded. Trey Mancini got traded. The Guardians get Reese Hoskins, uh, which is in a big trade. I can't really see because I scroll by them really fast, but I look at this Reese Hoskins one. Right after they get center fielder from us, they trade their first baseman. The Padres get Trey Mancini there. And then the Cubs get Scott Barlow. As we move on now, we start making trades of our own. We trade for all-star Austin Meadows for right fielder Seth Brown and Dermis Garcia, our first baseman. The Rays were looking for right field and first base. And Seth Brown, I'm pretty sure, becomes a starting right fielder instantly. Austin Meadows, he's kind of just lost in the lineup for the Rays. So I'd gladly take him. Good potential, young guy. And here I go over the first base and I up Dermis Garcia's potential. So it's not like they're just trading for a deep potential first baseman. I up it to about a 73. So now they get two very good players for one young one. And here the Red Sox want Sean Murphy. So I get Blaze Jordan and Brian Matta. Two very good players. 
young potential guys. I'm actually going to move Blaze Jordan to first base. And Sean Murphy gets off the team after struggling all year. And that goes up Shang Langliers. So guys, thank you guys for watching. Huge trades. Next episode, you'll see a different A's team.